Good morning, everyone. I worked um, as a uh, I did eyewitness uh, identification research for eight years as a graduate student, so I'm going to talk about the uh, Innocence Project a little bit. A witness's testimony. Oh, oh, you're starting? Yeah, let's go. One, two, three, go. A witness's testimony at trial can be very compelling evidence. This is especially the case with victims, and even more so when the victim is really confident. And they all have a tendency to be, by the time they get on the stand, because they're rehearsed and they've been coached. So they get up there and they point at the defendant and they make these statements like, I'll never forget that person's face, it'll haunt my dreams, and it's very compelling, it's persuasive. And the Innocence Project is an organization that helps people who are wrongfully convicted of crimes by assisting them with legal representation, helping them petition for um, DNA testing to, to get them exonerated. And of their database of some 300 and odd cases, three quarters of them have involved um, eyewitness testimony as part or all of the evidence presented against the person. In an ironic twist, this uh, gentleman, Don Thompson, an Australian uh, expert in eyewitness testimony, walked into a police station on routine business and was convict, um, identified as a rapist. And what happened was he was on TV the prior night giving um, a talk about the unreliability of memory and a woman saw him on television and the police didn't believe him when he said that he was on the program uh, with the assistant police commissioner. They said, yeah, I'm sure you had Jesus Christ and the Queen of England too. Um, eventually they figured out what happened when they interviewed the witness again and realized she was watching that exact same program when this intruder broke in and it got cleared up and we end up with an amusing story. Others are not as lucky. Um, Tyrone Hicks uh, was identified as the Bronx rapist from a composite sketch. This sketch looked so much like him that his own parents turned him in. And of course, the witness identified him from the lineup because she now has a more uh, dominant memory of the sketch she helped create. In the case of Bennett Barber, he was identified as a man who forcibly abducted and raped a woman at gunpoint. But Barber didn't match the physical description of the perpetrator. He didn't own or have easy access to a gun. He had four witnesses testify to his alibi, and he had a brittle bone disease that has had his arm pinned together at the time of the attack. Also, he blood typing suggested um, that he was not the guy and no follow-up was done. He was convicted and served his sentence before he was exonerated. He served, um, I, I don't have the years. Um, so what happened was he got help eventually when he was exonerated with the help from the Innocence Project, and he was able to vote a right that's denied to many ex-felons. And so November 2012, a wheelchair-bound barber voted for the first and last time um, because he died of bone cancer, sadly, just two months later. Antonio Beaver, another man, was misidentified as the carjacker in a very violent attack in which the attacker cut his arm and bled all over the car. Uh, immediately following the crime, the victim described the carjacker as being tall, clean-shaven black man wearing a baseball cap with a David Letterman-like gap in his teeth. Beaver was six foot tall, had no cuts anywhere two days after the um, attack, a very full mustache. Just a couple of days later, a broken front tooth as well, and that was the thing that got him convicted. He was in one of the worst lineups ever. There was only four people, two of whom were wearing a baseball cap. He was one, and only one had a gap, a broken tooth. He did. Um, so. He served 18 years. I want to be clear, though, about what I'm saying about eyewitness memory. It's not awful. It's not largely incorrect. Eyewitnesses are usually pretty good, but the problem is that it's unreliable. We can't tell when they're wrong. And they can be, their memories can be vivid, they can be very detailed, and they're very confident. So it's important to ask questions, and asking questions and being skeptical is not disrespectful to the victim. It's essential. We need to find out and make the right decisions. Um, it's worse to convict an innocent person. So we need to ask questions like, uh, who, when, was the li when did the lineup happen? Who else was in the lineup? How long after the crime did the identification uh, take place? Was there even a lineup? Sometimes there's not even that. Uh, so these, asking these questions is not disrespectful. It would be far worse for the victim to endure another trauma and identify the, an innocent man. And that just adds another victim to the original crime. So um, we, we need to be skeptical and we need to be exercise a little bit of extra caution when that's the primary evidence available because one tragedy doesn't create uh, erase another. And these are tragic cases. These people lose 
decades of their lives and if they're in death penalty states, sometimes their lives, they lose valuable years that we can't give them, uh, give back to them. And sometimes they don't even receive compensation for the time that they've spent in jail. So if you would like to know more about the Innocence Project, the kinds of things that uh, contribute to these sorts of errors, please go to the innocenceproject.org and you can look up your local branch there if you would like to volunteer. They're always looking for help. <laughs>